Well, what a pleasure it is to be here this afternoon. Um, I have to tell you, had I gone to the Bobby and I'm convinced I would not have come back. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, tearing yourselves away from one of the great collections of the world and coming to talk this afternoon with me about evidence and data and the long view. Um, I should, many of you know that I started life as an archeologist. Actually, my PhD is in American history and the slides don't work. Well, isn't this exciting? Uh, I know we did. Okay, so about 10 years ago, I was editing. I was going to tell you a funny story. Victoria, this is, let me introduce Victoria Stodden. I'm a big Victoria Stodden fan. Victoria, would you come up, stand up, and let us all see you? Yay! Uh, so even before I knew you, Victoria, and Cliff Lynch up in the right-hand corner, my right-hand corner, um, I knew you. I was editing a magazine called Imp, and this was a magazine um, that I did for what was then Science Applications International, SAIC, and their policy unit. And this was a, um, not a magazine I named for myself, although I was accused of this, but it was a magazine on the implications and impacts of IT. So I went to a meeting, it was hosted by Tom Khalil, who some of you may know, it was back in um, the very end of the Clinton-Gore days. And Tom had organized a meeting about the, what uh, one of the issues we all cared about called the productivity paradox. And um, uh, Paul Daniel, Paul Daniel, yes, uh, was giving us a, uh, a talk in a speech, his slides didn't come up, they had gotten lost in a somewhere between Stanford and Washington, and this happened. Of course, no one ever lost luggage between here and any place else. So he didn't have his slides, and so he was very entertaining, and I was getting ready to do this for you, about saying, well, you know, the next slide would have shown this, if only we could have brought it up. So instead, um, here we are. Let me back up one. Because this is an image of the Earth from space, and this is a NASA image, not an NSF image. And um, I'm doing this in part because I knew we had an astrophysicist to start us off, and in part to make the point that um, at least two agencies of the U.S. government deal with astronomical uh, data. One of them is the National Science Foundation, and the other one is NASA. Now, we know that this is a NASA photograph because satellite-based telescopes are the, proven are the provenance of NASA, whereas terrestrial telescopes like the LSST that you heard this mor about this morning are the work of NSF. So we know now that this is a NASA image and we have demonstrated interagency cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes the point that data and the way we understand the provenance and the source of data may not be the way the researcher wants to use the data. An astronomer may not care very much about who, whose instrument he or she is working with. Uh, he cares about what he can see or she can see. Now, um, you of course do care about the nature of the image. You want to know a lot about the instrument. But the fact that this, and you want to know that you're seeing it from space, seeing Earth from space, as opposed to seeing space from Earth. All of those things matter. But the, the source of it and organizing that information in terms of the agency that funded it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense if what you care about is astronomical imagery. They want us to think about that, how the format and the source and the way we create and manage the information may not align very well with what the researcher wants to do. So hearkening back to my own <coughs> career and about 10 years of it spent as a North American archaeologist. I was doing what is called, I believe in Europe, salvage archaeology. We call it cultural resource management. <laughs> but, it is, but it is driven not by the science question. It is driven by the needs of the developer who under U.S. law is required to mitigate uh, the, his, his or her actions uh, and to examine the built as well as the natural environment, and if something bad happens, to do some, is anticipated, well, one does something about it. Now, these images that I have for you here are actually from the collections of the National Science Foundation, and so they, re they represent er researcher-driven archaeology. In the northwest quadrant, 
is a tracing of a Maya sun god taken from an archaeological site in Guatemala. So we looked at the heavens before we had telescopes with which to do so. The one on the upper northeast quadrant is a foundation from Jamestown, which was the first permanent English settlement in what became the United States. The one on the right are petroglyphs. They are images of giraffes, and it's from a site in Africa. And the one in the center and to the left is um, a computationally driven reconstruction of the site Machu Picchu, and you see in the center the lasers and the, uh, the laser and the team that's actually doing the work and holding a computer. And that one I enjoy very much because it's in a sense a marriage of three disciplines. You have the, compu the computers and the imaging that comes out of physics and computer science and engineering. That's three directorates in NSF speak. You have the geospatial sciences, which is the theoretical underpinnings for how you actually assemble the information. And then there's the archaeological remain, uh, resource itself that it seeks to, <coughs> to reconstruct. So if you were going to organize the world by format, where would we put that? Okay, so if you're at the Library of Congress, do you put it in your image collections? Do you put it in geography and maps? Is it really belong in computer science? Where does it belong? So again, <coughs> like my... <coughs> the earlier comments, we are less interested as researchers in the characteristics of the data that help us manage it than we are in the research that we want to pursue. And that's simply a piece of it. Now, in the world that you just visited, those of you who went to the Bobbian, we know there's a whole science about rare books and paleography, and we saw some of that demonstrated this morning, in which we look at the attributes of the construction of the artifact as a way of seeing into the history itself. So this exploration of format has research value as well. But I think the point is here that before we have, before we had the data deluge and before we had big data and all the rest of it, we were coping with making sense of data. And it's making sense of data and the value we place on it that creates evidence. And that's what the researcher cares about, is evidence in support of the hypothesis. Now, Victoria, that was my line for you. <coughs> so what are we going to talk about? Well, of course, we're going to talk about data management, having made the point that we care about this in, search, in pursuit of the science. And I'd like to sort of look back at the last 20 years or so and think about what has happened and what that means for us in the creation of, these, of data and evidence. And then let's look at a future state where information is ubiquitous, and then go to the next step, since I know you all want to know what NSF is doing about public access. So a quick look backwards. Yes. How many times have you seen this slide now? <laughs> so here we are. So let's think about IT, scholarly communication, and the nature of evidence. One always needs a third hand at times like this. When I looked at this and I thought about what, we, what had happened in the last 20 years, I came up with four big ideas. One is capture and analytical techniques, and that was the laser reconstruction that was evidenced in the first slide. There is also a very powerful tool called simulation, right? So simulation as a tool, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll buy into Dan Dennett, let's say it's simulation as a fourth kind of, of data. That all sits on top of connectivity and communications technologies, which both enable the, the large-scale remote capture and it enables us to talk to each other. And then there's a fourth layer of the text word processing and collaboration, presentation stuff, and that's how we talk to each other. So when we talk about scholarly communication or scientific communication, we're generally talking about bullet number four. But bullet number four is part of one, two, and three. Now, I think the capture and analytical technologies are what we're talking about when we're talking about big data. We can just simply do a lot, collect a lot more stuff at a higher level of granularity with greater heterogeneity. So, what has happened? 
Well, of course, there's heterogeneous data and objects. There's lots of it, and they're very different. I think that another outcome of this has been a change in expectations about what is visible and what is not visible. A lot of the discussion about public or access, open access, and transparency, I think, arises from the recognition that we can simply see more deeply into the research process than we could see before. Scientists always talk to each other, right? We have the letters from Galileo, we have the letters from Newton, we, we can do reconstructions of who talked to whom. So it's not that they didn't talk to each other, and it's not that we didn't have problems with storage preservation and access, but what we can see now and see broadly now is what was the informal or the invisible, <coughs> and that becomes visible. And it, the question then becomes, what, how does that figure into the scientific record, and what is the role of the different pieces? We also have a vocabulary and a logic based on objects with properties. And here we're talking about identifiers, description, and location. So um, I, I did a search in September of this year on the term metadata, right? And I did a search in the Washington Post, my hometown newspaper, hardly the most sophisticated technical journal out there. And I was delighted to retrieve roughly 15,000 hits. So what were the top five? Not surprisingly, three of the top five dealt with surveillance technologies. Number four had to do with a court then pending in the second federal district. And number five was my all-time favorite. It had to do with a viral beer ad. <laughs> so metadata, I submit to you, has entered into the common parlance, at least in the Washington Post. And finally, we have software as a first-class object. Now, on the one hand, software permeates everything. We're struggling up here with a combination of hardware and software devices. But we also have software as an explicit tool. And we can think about software the way you think about the rare books that you saw at the Bodleian or the paleography that we did with, man with uh, medieval manuscripts. So we have a well-developed way of looking at this. And now the question becomes, how is it that the software tool that we have is affecting the set of results that we want to interpret? So we heard this morning that physicists throw out a whole bunch of stuff, right? That's what he told us. And that's partly a function of the tool. It's able to collect so much more than is meaningful and that you can process that the tool itself is, is biasing or, or, in, or limiting or affecting what it is we indeed collect and how it is we interpret that. And the interesting thing I thought in that talk was, well, if you actually don't throw away all that stuff, but you take some small sample of it, are you going to see something? And I'm sure the biologists in the room can remember the time when everyone said of the DNA, RNA, that all you cared about was the DNA, right? The RNA was just trash. Well, you know, we've rethought that one, and sometimes trash becomes very interesting to us. Similarly, it's not just the genetic code. We now talk about epigenetics and all kinds of <coughs> phenomena that were previously either un invisible to us or we did not understand what to do with them. So the software becomes part of that discussion. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about three questions. The first one is the basic question that we ask in data management. Do you store the data <coughs> in the same place as you, as you collect it? Do you co-locate managing the data with where you store the data? So if you say yes, then you tend to like closely coupled architectures. And if you say no, well, no, you're more comfortable with distributed or cloud structures. And these are not mutually exclusive. So in the case of the LSST, I, I don't think Alex Delay is here with us today. I first heard it from Alex. Alex said years ago that here we had spent all these years learning how to do uh, empower the user and move data and computation to the, to the desk, desktop but we were going to be collecting so much data through the LSST, you heard the numbers this morning, that it's simply impractical to move the data to the desktop and we're reverting then, or moving to a system in which the experiment has to be moved to the data. So there's an example where you simply are restruct, where it's not a question of, I prefer closely, where the nature of the data, the scale of the data is driving the architecture of the, of the instrument and the resource. 
On the other hand, when I ask around the foundation and say, okay, wh why do we care about distributed architectures? Well, we can obtain certain kinds of efficiencies, and they're very, very good when you want to incorporate a high level of coherence over a highly heterogeneous set of communities and data. So again, back to my problem with which I opened, what do you do when you have the digital reconstruction of Machu Picchu? Well, you may have to actually store that data in a number of places, but you want to be make that distributed storage invisible to the end user, and it becomes unified then at a higher level. So George Alter, we had this discussion yesterday. So where does that leave software? Well, sort of somewhere in the middle, and I would argue that it's, it may not even be part of this question of, of how you structure it, but software itself needs to be managed and curated, <coughs> preferably in association with the data that, you, that it renders and where the user can get to it. So question number two. This is the big one, right? Who gets access to what and when, under what circumstances? So this takes us to the world of policy. It also takes us to the world of restrictions and permissions on access and use. And we have had issues about restrictions on permission well before we had challenges in digital data. So back at the very end of the dark ages, when I finished my dissertation, um, you had to apply for permission to use certain kinds of artifacts. So in the rare, you to go to use um, documents at the rare book room at the New York Public Library. I was working on French Protestants and it ha they happened to have an interesting collection of pamphlets that I wanted to look at. Well, you had to ask permission to look at it because it had to do with the rarity, how to handle documents, and who was permitted to see this. So we, we tend to think about restrictions and permissions on access and use in terms of legal copyright or personally identifiable information. And, but, but we've always had this. And the values that, that drive the nature of the permission has something to do with the art, artifact. And it also has to do with the way the larger society views the use of that material. And finally, we have questions in the, in the, in the access space on <coughs> standards and formats. So standards and formats make it easier for users to work with the material. And of course, they become obsolete, or you want one that's not made available. So I've been told, for example, that NSF does not make information accessible. We make it available because I didn't make it available in the format that the investigator wanted to use. So OK, once upon a time, OECD made data available as print on paper, also known as PDFs. So, you know, that wasn't terribly useful. Let's face it, nobody wants to retype all that stuff. On the other hand, is it a reasonable expectation to make it available, downloadable in, one of, in a different format and to expect someone to transform the, transform the data to something that's more useful? And this is a discussion. So what constitutes a reasonable level of access for whom and when and under what circumstances? So now let's go to question number three, which is the hard one, in case you thought the other ones were easy. Who and what can I trust? Now this is one that I don't have an answer to, but there is a lot of research. And it's one, as a social scientist, that I actually care a lot about. Now, when I started to think about this problem of trust was, oh, in the late 1990s, and I was writing for Bob Kahn, and I was writing a series of small monographs on large-scale technology-intensive infrastructures and I had written about transportation, and I had written about electrical power, and now I was uh, getting to one on uh, banking and money. And I was thinking about banking and money as a form of information. It's a highly structured form of information. So Bob said to me, I called him Dr. Khan in those days, so Bob said to me, um, how did trust get in the system? And I sort of thought about this, and I said, well, what do you mean? And well, you know, in his, the way Bob was thinking about it is, well, something is trustworthy if, if I can, if it has a, hash, a, a, a hashing sum attached to it, a check sum attached to it, and I can repeat that, and I know that no one has tampered with it. So it's, it's trustworthy if it's authentic, in some sense authentic. So I thought about that some more. And a few years later, I was uh, working on another project, and 
I uh, was working with Stephen Lukasik. Now, Stephen Lukasik had been head of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency at the tail end of the period when the internet was controlled by DARPA and before it was transitioned to the NSF. So this was the early days when it was still an experimental network. And I asked him about trust. And he said, um, Amy, trust is when the system does what I expect it to do. That's the first half. It does what you expect it to do. And it doesn't do what I expect it not to do. So you put the key in the ignition and turn it on the car and you expect the engine to turn over, or do whatever it is they do in modern cars. You don't expect the thing to instantly go into reserve, into reverse the way my father's VW did when I was first learning to drive. So this was a long time ago. So I thought about that and I thought, okay, um, that that's works, it's operational. But it took me a while to realize why it, why it works, why it's operational. And that's because it's sitting on top of a fundamental principle in social science, which is reciprocity, right? So people have trust when, again, you do something in the Godfather uh, movies, you do something and, the some and someone responds the way you expect that someone to, do, to respond. So, you can, so this is a fundamental principle. It underlies conflict, it underlies communication, it underlies fundamental social interactions. So, you know, here's a nice example, she said from the SPE director, with my SPE hat on, of why you can have an operational principle, something you can program, a system principle, that in fact works, because it sits on top of a fundamental attribute of human behavior. So there we are. Those are the three questions that I would like you to think about. I'd like you to think about trust and how we operationalize trust. I'd like you to think about who gets access to what and when. And I'd like you to think about how do we manage things? Where do we put them? <clears throat> and do they need to be in the same place? And so now let's think about what's the future state will look like when information is ubiquitous. So let's imagine an environment where an, an investigator, because we're, we're talking about the research environment, where the investigator uploads something once and it can be used by many. So this is upload once, use many. What's one property of this ubiquitous environment, I imagine? There can be others. And then let's think about an, a, the specific environment that you all and I care about today, which is what do you, how would, would that environment work with all publications, and let's have a very loose definition of publication. It's not just the journal article, let's have dissertations, let's have books, let's have plays, let's have all the kinds of human expression we care about, but it's research so it sits on top of, in, of evidence, so you have an, an environment in which the publication is linked to the underlying evidence. So that would be digital scientific data in our space today. But of course, I would want to link to archaeological collections. And maybe I'd like to link to images of paintings if I were talking about something that was uh, also illustrated in a painting. Link to the analytical tools and, of course, link to the software. So that's, that's the world. Those are two properties of this ubiquitous inf information environment. So if we agree that, that's, that th that's, those are good things to do, what, what would it take to get there? What can government do? And of course, what can all of you do? Because we are all in this together. So we're talking, of course, about a collaborative research culture. And that collaborative research culture is sitting on top or enabled by an infrastructure. And that infrastructure has a few th properties that we can identify. The first is unique persistent identifiers. And that was the subject of a number of workshops yesterday. It has metadata and description. It has repositories and storage. And it has platforms that enable collaboration and sharing. Yes, so that's Mendeley, that's ResearchGate, that's, I think it's ReadCube that Nature Publishing has, that's um, a number of these platforms that we have seen come into existence in the last couple of years. Um, those are fairly new uh, in, in the way I've thought about this problem, and they are less new in the sense of t the technologies. These are technologies that we understand, and there have been efforts to do similar kinds of things. But what I think is interesting about them is the ability that they have now to enable collaboration and sharing. And I'm reminded of an interview I had a, no a long time ago with one of the founders of the Palm Pilot. Now, does anybody in here remember the Palm Pilot? <laughs> okay, yeah. 
I didn't have one. I'm you know, very much the, the technological laggard. So I was talking to her. It was a husband and wife team. And uh, she predicted. Now, this was around 1998. And so this was early in this. And we had already seen in um, the recesses of the internet culture a lot of discussion of what we were then calling nomadicity. Cliff, do you remember nomadicity? Right. Now we call it remote, OK? Uh, so nomadicity. And um, Donna said, you know, well, the poem was successful, and that's great. But she thought that the trick to this, and this is pre-apps, right? No one was writing apps at this point. She thought that the trick to this was not that they were doing anything particularly different, but that they would, or what was different about what they were doing was that they were mad going to manage the form function of the device. You know, it's always a delight when software people talk to you about a physical object. It really makes me feel safe. Um, the form function of the device with the right set of functionalities. So we've been experimenting with these kind of these collaborative spaces since the very beginning. Chat rooms are collaborative spaces. They really don't exist just for pornography. So, you know, if if we look at that, so from the start, right, back even in the command line days, which some of us still miss. I mean, I'm a command line person. I'm an old Unix person. I grieve uh, for the app. You know, th this graphical user interface thing makes me very uncomfortable here, 20 years into it. So. But right from the start, we, we built environments, however primitive the language, that would let us communicate and share and interact, preferably not one-to-one, -one, but many-to-many. -many. So maybe the time has come. Maybe we've made enough advances in the underlying technology that we've reached the point where these platforms, Mendeley, ResearchGate, and so on, will come into their own. So maybe we're looking at the, at the, the equivalent of the Palm Pilot. We have the right mix of form function, functionality, and capabilities. Let me know next year. Around this, we have to foster institutions that enable consensus building around standards and best practices. And that, of course, informs all four of my other ones. These are not purely technological advances. All of those will come about because the communities of use, they'll be appropriate to the communities of use, and they will adapt to the communities of use. And finally, we have to create a new system of rewards and incentives. Right now, the world in which we live is completely oriented with the best will in the world to the achievement of the individual. We grant promotion and tenure to individuals. We cite authors in a sequence. You, when you have 3,000 or 6,000 authors, well, you have a pointer to the web page. So attribution is incredibly important to science. It goes to do I trust, right? But what we know how to do is maybe a team of five. After five, we get uncomfortable. Now, it's true, there are, there are rules. We, we've been able to handle large team science. But it's really an expansion on a model that was predicated on the individual. So we have to move past that. And not, you know, we're tinkering around this, around the edges of this. We're trying to find different ways to acknowledge different kinds of contribution to the team. And that's a start. But I think that to truly move to this ubiquitous information environment where you have complex ar uh, objects that engage the work of lots and lots of people, we, we are moving the, out of a world that prizes individual achievement and into a world that prizes collaboration. And I don't think it's an accident, then, that many very successful university presidents, like Charles Best at MIT and, and outside of Boston, are engineers. Because engineering, civil engineering in particular, is a culture of large teams where the success of the project is predicated on the ability to move the team. <coughs> so what can government do? This is what I talk about. This is where I work. Well, the first thing you want to do is to articulate policy. Those are the rules. How is this going to work? And that is very, very difficult. So let's just lay that out there. Even talking from um, one agency of the US government, and it's only one agency, it's difficult because, first of all, science is international. And the, the legal rubrics, the national rubric within which we work in the US, is not mapped perfectly to the way the national rubrics work elsewhere. So we see this, for example, and, and it, it, it goes to the research 
in, um, if, so the easiest example in my mind is, comes from paleontology, from human remains. So there's extensive work done in this area, in Africa, of course, and the African nations have become resentful of seeing their resource base expropriated and sent to the U.S. So, you know, it's, it's heavily licensed. You have to be careful. You're not allowed to work on certain sites. You have to make sure that the remains stay appropriately in the nation. Now, the, the nation, the political entity, may have very little to do with the science that you wish to do, but that's an example of policy, and the policies have to be harmonized. An example in the digital space that I encountered very early in my career had to do with was when I was editing DLib. And we were trying, we, were, we had gone global, and we wanted to do a story. I called them stories, not articles. They were not peer-reviewed. They were Amy-reviewed. Actually, I was praying that I would get enough pieces in the journal to re release it on, one, on a monthly basis. So um, we, we had, uh, it was coming out of the medical space. And we were requested by uh, a number of the, what we would call conservative Middle Eastern states to remove the images because they were perceived as offensive. So what became to us a medical image in another context on the internet became problematic. So there's policy. And policy and science is international and it has to figure out ways to transcend uh, a set of boundaries. It, at the national level in the US, um, this is, uh, most of you probably know this, but let me remind you, um, we are not highly centralized. You have state policy, you have local policy, and you have federal policy. And free, there are things that we can do at the federal level. There are levers, if you will, that we can pull. There are relatively few controls. So when I was practicing this with my colleagues at the NSF, we, happened on the, we decided that the language of levers was more useful to think of rather than a language of controls. So we can nudge people to use that nice expression in certain directions. We can attach requirements to federal funding, but we don't control. Finally, there's um, a lot happens in relationships at the university level. So again, in the National Science Foundation context, we don't intervene in the relationship between the employer and the employee, between the dean and the faculty. So this goes, as George and I were discussing yesterday, to our intellectual property policy. So NSF's international policy, like all federal law, is actually quite hands-off. We don't claim a lot of rights. We actually, we don't claim copyright in the intellectual output. That belongs to the awardee institution. Now, by convention, that tends to be assigned to the investigator. But as George pointed out, certainly in the space of, copy, of patent, as opposed to copyright, there are real rights questions here about who owns what as the result of federal investment. George, should I get that right? George is nodding for those of you who, there's George, wave George. Okay, so this is a whole lot harder than it works, than it looks. Secondly, in the federal space, when we do develop implementations, they can have two properties. One is make it easy to do the right thing and make it hard to do the wrong thing. And the second thing is, I think we have to be, be wary of premature specification and over-engineering systems. So for, for all that we've been playing in this space now for 20 odd years, I, I think it's still, we still need to think about this as early days because so much of the technology and so much of what we want to do with the technology is evolving quickly. So we would, I would argue for a minimalist approach rather than a maximalist approach to the way we formulate policy and the way that policy is translated into implementation. Now implementation can frequently mean in the NSF context because we are an external granting agency. Uh, we don't do any research in-house unlike other federal agencies that you may be aware of. Um, like the USGS, okay, the United States Geological Survey, Okay, it's not, it <coughs> does almost no extramural funding. They do, um, all of the work is intramural. So you see I was on a panel with someone from USGS and I went through what NSF did and he stood up and he's a friend of mine and he said, you can't imagine an agency more different from, from NSF than the USGS. So it can become challenging. It's hard to understand that the agencies are different. But overall, when we, when we are writing rules, when we are giving people instructions on how to submit a proposal or request for funding, I think we should err on the light side rather than the heavy side. 
And finally, I think we should encourage use of infrastructure elements that have been adopted by the research communities. And that means that in something like the National Science Foundation, it will be characterized not only by a light hand, but by the recognition of a very high level of diversity. So before we, so you know, here let's uh, take a moment to contemplate some of the milestones in public access and in reviewing this slide after I had sent it on um, to the organizers. Of course, this is US centric and for that I apologize. So let me take a minute to introduce you to the National Science Foundation as you sort of look at this overly dense slide. Um, so how many of you are familiar with us? Enough, okay. So to remind all of you and for those of you who may not be familiar with us, um, the National Science Foundation is, as I said, a basic research funding agency. It gets about a $7 billion award from uh, appropriation from the U.S. Congress every year. And about 90% of that goes out of house in the form of awards to, uh, uh, to institutions. So the first legal point for the lawyers in the room, the award is to the institution, not to the investigator. The investigator is the employee of the institution. However, usually when the principal investigator leaves uh, that institution, the award is terminated if it hasn't been complete and reassigned to the investigator at his or her new institution. So the relationship between the research and the investigator is preserved. Now that's, <clears throat> we have seven major directorates corresponding to roughly the seven branches of, if you will, of uh, advanced, re uh, advanced research and science. So that's math and physical sciences, it's the geological, science, ge geological sciences, biological sciences, social behavioral and economic sciences. Um, there's a couple of other, uh, education and human resources, which is research and education and capacity building, and computer and information sciences and engineering, which is where I currently live. And that you work hard within the foundation to do cross cuts, to find um, examples to co-fund projects, it's called, when they uh, overlap. So some, project, some uh, applications that come in, <clears throat> a lot of the work in economics, for example, we're very proud of our record of supporting Nobel laureates. Um, that comes squarely into the core economics programs. But there are other programs that, um, like the one I get, showed you in the first slide, where it overlaps into geospatial sciences, computational sciences, and of course, archaeology. As a result of this, and that given the diversity of disciplines and communities with which we work, formulation of policy is actually quite different, difficult at the NSF. It's highly non-prescriptive. So it's, an, it's a principle at the NSF that in fact, you, when we formulated the data management plan in 2011, it was intentionally very high level. Now I know this gives librarians heartburn. They complain to me on a regular basis. Can't you be more specific? Okay, you don't have to raise your hands. If you've complained to me, I know who you are. And we do that because you don't make policy for the foundation on a, <coughs> on a community by community basis. You want one policy that works more or less well across all of, yes, Martin, you're nodding, um, that works more or less well as a principle across all of the disciplines. So let's think about what that means for data for a moment. Particle uh, data illustrative of particle physics, the astrophysical data that you saw this morning, doesn't look anything like school student records. Hands? Right. For one thing, we don't allow particles to hire lawyers. If we did, we'd never get anything done. Okay. <clears throat> now, children may not hire lawyers, but their parents do. And there are, there are good and sound reasons why it is that you want to be very sensitive to the way student records are handled. On the other hand, there's a lot you can learn about the efficacy of certain kinds of curriculum development. There's a lot we can learn about the nature of learning if we can get to student records. The work, for example, on brain plasticity, <clears throat> it's one thing to study what, what a child can understand, an infant. We have work that we've just funded and the results were widely publicized about the infant brain from zero to six months and you slide an infant through an MRI machine and see how the, ch the child's brain was reacting. Well, you want to be able to look at the performance uh, of characteristics, the neuroscience of children, say not just from zero to six months when they can't argue with you. You might want to see how that child behaves at the age of six years, 16, and so on. 
And these are issues fraught not just with the legal questions associated with, le with legislation called FERPA, which strikes fear in the heart of every sponsored research officer. I notice several of them turning pale. Uh, <clears throat> but you want, but it, you have to be compliant with other, um, le uh, other legislation protecting personal privacy. So the, the data management plan came out in 2011, and it was followed at NSF with a second, I think, really important but overlooked bit of policy in 2013. And in an NSF application, as about two-thirds of you know, there's something called a biosketch, a biographical sketch. And in a biographical sketch, one is permitted to provide ex five examples of work that's relevant to the proposal that's being submitted, and then five examples of work that sort of indicates how good a scholar you are. And, and this is highly prescribed. You get 10, you give more than 10, they don't read it. That was expanded in 2013 to include data. It went from journals, books, and other conventional forms of public, uh, publication to include authorship of data, and there's the rudiments of a citation format in there. And we can argue about the adequacy of that format. I had problems with it myself when it was issued. But my point is, is that by, we have merely in that, it, you know, it took years to add three words to an NSF guideline. Merely by adding those very few words, we signaled that data sets and contribution to a data set would be equivalent to contribution or authoring of a journal article. Now, I consider that one of our great moments. And I hope you do too as well. So and there are other things. I'm sure you're familiar with the OSTP memo on increasing access to um, results of federally funded research. That falls basically into two buckets. That came out in 2013. One bucket is the data management plan, which is very similar to NSF's requirements. And the other one has to do with access to um, journal publications. There is also the Open Data Executive Order. There tends to be some confusion about the relationship between the OSTP memo and the Executive Order on Open Data. The Open Data Executive Order concerns government data. That is to say, data that is collected by the government in execution of its responsibilities. The simple example are the statistical agencies and the data that, that they collect. Uh, we house one of those units at the foundation, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. It collects all kinds of data about the performance of the scientific enterprise, and all of the data is available on the web. Okay, so our principles. One is that we are deferential to the communities. We expect the specifics of how data to be managed to be <coughs> to be um, illuminated and articulated by the communities and then recognized in the way we evaluate data management plans through peer review. So I probably skipped this part of it when I trotted past data management plans. Data management plans are two-page documents. They are uh, required supplementary uh, uh, materials to an NSF application. Uh, they, and they respond to a series of, of questions about where, what are the data? Where are they going to be put? Who's the likely user? Um, and by the way, it, they address evidence. It's physical specimens as well as data. Anything that is collected in the course of the execution of the, of the research. And this was obligatory. And in fact, we have almost 100% compliance because you can automate a system that if there is no two-page management plan submitted as part of the publication in the automated system, it is automatically returned without review. So, it's <clears throat> so that happened exactly once, that people did not include a data management plan, and interestingly, compliance went right up. Now, not all data management plans are good, and a data management plan can also say, we're not gonna do it for this, and here's why. Or there's a program called SBR, SBIR, small business innovation research in which it is understood that the data that are created may be intrinsic to the proprietary interests of the, of the enterprise that you're trying to foster. So in that case, there's a perfectly legitimate reason to withhold access to the data. Remember the part about withholding access? Well, there's lots of reasons to do that. But the point is, is you have this document attached to every submission to the NSF that explains what the data are, what you're gonna do about it, and who gets access to it. And whether or not the data management plan is good, that is to say meets the needs of the research, is to be determined by the communities. So we look to all of you 
to tell us what a good data management, data management plan should contain for that community. Secondly, it implicitly acknowledges a distributed environment of multiple stakeholders and individuals. So this goes again to the diversity of the communities covered by the National Science Foundation, what we call the long tail. In fact, the body of the, of the animal is pretty small and the tail is really, really long and can be quite fat. Are, <coughs> having acknowledged the diversity and the highly distributed environment, however, we want a coherent set of principles. And that, that has led to the rather high level principles that we articulate, including the fact that, well, it's going to come from the communities. But we only want one policy. You don't want a policy for bio and the protein data, the proteomics and, and molecular structures. You don't want to try to get a high level of detail and make that work for large hadron collider data or for astronomical imagery or for what comes out of a paleontological site, a paleontological site that may be subject to international controls or archaeology or so on down the full range of sciences that the NSF supports. And of course, they address evidence. So I repeat, the NSF's data management plan, although it contains the word data, is not confined to digital scientific data. It covers the full range of scientific evidence recovered as part of the research. So, I'm very conscious that I'm between you and the ice cream and it's making me real. <laughs> I mean, the worst one of these I ever saw was the poor soul who had the five o'clock piece before the beer was, you know. Now, I'm not a beer drinker myself, but if it had been red wine, I'm here to tell you, it wouldn't have worked that way. So, okay, what, what should you expect, those of you who do business with the NSF? Well, NSF's approach to public access will, not surprisingly, recognize that the communities are different. And we have to have one large, high-level coherent policy that works for a highly divergent set of communities. So to give you a sense of exactly how I, what we're dealing with, I uh, did some research that I know at least one of you has heard before, Victoria. I asked to see the annual reports for fiscal F11 and 12, and I said, tell me out of the reports, those of you who know how these systems work, show me the list of journals in which NSF investigators publish so that I know who I'm going to have to work with. And I got a list of 50 plus thousand journal titles. So, okay, publishers in the room, how many scholarly scientific journals are there out there? What's the number that you all use? I use 75,000. What? I use 75,000. 75,000? 75, 35. 35? Okay, the canonical number I got from ACS is 23,000. Now, as of today, I'm going to up that to 23,002. <laughs> Right? We heard of one, at least two new ones that are in the process of formation. So, okay, there's plus or minus 23,000, maybe 35,000. If you go to ISSN, the International Standard Serials Database, they talk about 100 plus thousand titles that they cover, but those are not strictly scholarly journals. However, if we went with my 23,000 or even 35,000, I submit to you that's not 50 plus thousand. So, okay, we have a disambiguation problem here, and let's reduce it by 15 or 20 percent. And let's say um, maybe it's only down to 15,000 journals. Well, well, that's a lot of journals. <clears throat> it's a lot of journals, and they vary a lot in how robust they are, how frequently they, they publish. So you can have an education journal, for example, that only publishes twice a year. Or you can have the tribe of physics, series A, physics series B, physics series whatever, that, public, that seem to be releasing um, a, a new edition of the journal on a daily basis. It's not a single journal, it's a family of journals, but there are a whole lot of them and they're prolific. So we have to recognize that science takes place in communities and those communities are highly heterogeneous. There's, <clears throat> so there, that's the diversity, that's the range of institutions. And let's then talk about funding. We opened with an image about an astronomical phenomenon viewed <coughs> from a NASA image, and I said, well, if you're on the ground and you have a telescope, you're probably NSF, and if it's satellite-based, you're probably NASA. 
Not surprisingly, when I looked into uh, where our investigators are funded, very few of them only get NSF funding. And I, I did this two ways. I was in a meeting with all the uh, deputy assistant directors. The, those are essentially the chief operating officers of the seven directorates. And I went around the room and I said, okay, what do you think? Do your PIs have multiple funding? And oh, yeah. And I said, okay, where do they get it from? And they went around and so GEO said, oh, our people get NASA, not surprisingly, just geological. They, are they, get, they get money from NASA and from USGS and physics and math, math, physical sciences said, yeah, we have some NASA and some uh, Department of Energy. Uh, so I said, oh yeah, we do Department of Energy. And, and it, they, they knew where it was. And then I pulled up a part of um, the funding requests that I can see, but that is not publicly available because proposals are confidential. They are con <coughs> for obvious reasons. And I looked at a section of the proposal where it says current and pending support. And I said, okay, what other agencies are represented there? And not surprisingly, the deputy ADs knew exactly where, they're, where their uh, investigators are getting their funding from. But from my perspective, looking at this in terms of a future system design and questions about burden, not only do we have to deal with the intangibles, the community, the way you do research, the understanding what constitutes statistically valid evidence here as opposed to just statistically valid evidence there. When is it appropriate to use observation? When is it appropriate to do anything? There's the practical reality that any given article that we have to deal with then from a public access point of view is likely to have more than one funder and probably more than one federal funder particularly for big, complex projects that generate lots and lots of publications. I'm sure you looked at that stream of, of uh, funders and sponsors that uh, Chris showed us in his work on Galaxy Zoo, and that is not uncommon, although not everybody has a Chris to present for them, sadly. So that is another aspect of this, and it goes to this upload once, use many, read many, right? Here's a situation in which Federated digital libraries, federated solutions make a lot of sense. On the other hand, if you do that, that makes other kinds of operations very hard. So what is the tension? What is the right balance? Who is going to do what? And how, of course, do we leverage the very robust infrastructures that exist in the curatorial stewardship communities and as well as the ones that the publishers are building? Okay. The word build is out there, so as we move forward, we expect to build on current practice. And we expect to leverage the resources across the government, higher education, and the private sector. And this, again, flows naturally, in a sense, from the way the investigators do their work. They are already, in a sense, primed for us to look at relationships among the agencies, however challenging that can be, rather than trying to maintain current stovepipes, I'm actually rather fond of stovepipes, but current stovepipes among the agencies. So the plan provides a framework. At the advice of my friends in engineering who, who counseled very strongly in big complex projects, we're going to move forward in phases. So for those of you worried about a bucket of requirements coming down on you, you can put that worry to one side. We will learn from one phase to inform the next. And when I talk about the easy case, I'm talking about, frankly, journal publications that are published during the period of the award. That, from NSF's perspective, is the easiest case to deal with because we have two points of leverage, right? We have the moment when the award is submitted, the proposal, where, <clears throat> as you saw with the data management plan, we can attach something to the existing process that lets us go forward. And then we have that magic moment when a final report is submitted in which the investigator says, yes, indeed, I did what I was supposed to do. And at that point, although the investigator doesn't always know it, he or she is acting as an agent for the awardee institution, which is, in fact, the legal entity that is responsible. You're learning more about this than you ever wanted to know. Okay, we're focusing on publications with the expectation that we will extend the architecture to work with more than one entity and more than one research product. But this will take place over a number of years. We need to integrate our internal systems with the external systems for the very practical reason that you want to minimize your burden on your awardees, your investigators, as well as on your program officers. NSF is a very lean organization. 
We have a very low overhead, and the last thing you want to do from a system design point of view is add burden to the, to the program officer. So this becomes a system requirement for us. Similarly, there were hearings in the Congress last year in which it was claimed from reliable sources that about 42% of the investigator's time is spent dealing with administrative issues associated with the conduct of the award. Now, from the efficiency perspective, this is not something we want to encourage. And hard as it is to imagine, most of you did not go into research because you like to fill out forms for the NSF. We do try to make this entertaining, but it's, it's, you know there are other things that you could do with your time. So we would like to make uh, meeting our requirement easy for you. And to do that, we have to look at system integration, which I have learned is it really, really hard. And finally, we need to work with the communities, like all of you, to understand the needs with respect to data and data management. And this, of course, is an international challenge. It simply is. Science has been global since the days of Galileo, and it's gotten more rather than less so. So what should you expect? Many of you have seen this slide before. Basically, it says, yes, when we have an approved plan, we will post it. There will be a way for you to provide feedback to us. Um, doubtless, all of you will find something in it not to like. It's a compromise, and so that was the goal. Uh, our formal changes to procedures will be actually quite slow in coming. There's a federal-wide process of announcement and comment. So even after the plan is out, to the extent that formal changes are required, then we will give you as much time as we can for uh, you to know that it's coming. Those of you who work in sponsored research offices, we are not going to ask you to turn on a dime. We understand how hard that is. As much as possible, we will retain the existing requirements. That's the data management plan, the data citation, and of course, the one I always get, which is about money. For those of you um, who might be interested in gold open access, indeed, article processing charges can be requested as part of an NSF application as a direct charge. Now, the constraint here is that there is no new money, so that this comes out of the, uh, the, the, the ceilings on the awards. So we're in, we're in tight budgetary times. Everyone is. And to pay for this, we are going to have to make trade-offs. And in, for NSF, we will ask the investigators to make the trade-off. What is the choice? How do you want to deal with this? Is What is important to you? Where, where do you want this to go? It will not come centrally from us. And on the specifics, you should expect continued guidance at the program division and directorate level. So that's what we're going to do. What can you do? As I said, we're in this together. We expect you to tell us what good science looks like in your communities. So we ask that you adopt consistent practices concerning citation and, <clears throat> and deposit of data and software. And so you've all made wonderful progress on that. Check that box. Keep going with what you're doing. We ask that you recognize there are different kinds of intellectual products. It's not sufficient, although we're all worried about it, just to worry about the journal publication as the, as the primary intellectual product, although traditionally that is where the, historical, the scientific record has historically been embodied. We ask that you consider not only data, but, the, uh, but software. Start thinking about how you consistently identify software. How do you give it an identifier? How do you give it metadata? How do people understand what this tool was when you used it in a world in which dynamism is to be expected? For those of you who participate in NSF panels, merit review panels, we encourage you to start asking harder questions. So if you care about data management plans and you participate in an NSF panel, Start asking questions. Start asking questions about why something isn't done right. Start having that affect the way you think it should function. Similarly, those of you who are on editorial boards or review for editorial journals, ask to see the data. Ask if the data are going to be made available. Start rerunning tests. I'm told in economics, it is not uncommon for the reviewers to ask the, uh, the person submitting the article to see the data to verify that the, that the tables indeed are accurately constructed and that it says what it's going to say. Now, 
<clears throat> I understand that there are communities in which this makes people nervous, but start asking the questions. This is your science. This is some, a place where you can intervene to make the data meaningful and better, and, and, <clears throat> and overall to improve the science. <clears throat> and finally, encourage your students to become conversant in data and software. To understand what the tool is, how, what it does do, what it doesn't do, how it starts to bias the outcome. And to think about the culture, again, in which data are created and reused. So I, I happen to think that one of the impediments to reuse of data has to do with, with what counts for prestige in a science. So let me give you the example of, from North American archaeology. The real big guys in North American archaeology are the prehistorians. You know, they, they do this hard stuff. They look at mounds in the Mississippi Valley. They move dirt. You know, they're, they're really big guys. The little people were people like me who looked at historic sites. You know, the, the, the tough guys, the Navy SEALs of North American archaeology were the prehistoric people. So how do you talk about the reuse of data when part of the training is field work? And part of the prestige of what you've done is you have dug a new site. Repurposing and reusing an analytical work, in a sense, becomes a second-class citizen. So how is it, remember the collaborative culture? How is it that you change the perceptions of the value of the method by which the evidence is recovered and interpreted? So that it's almost as prestigious this is kind of pathetic in North American archaeology, to look at ceramics. It's almost as good to, to look at patterns in ceramic analysis, 1850s, that's kind of pathetic, as it is to excavate a Hohoka mound in the Mississippi Valley. So I close with a quotation from Benjamin Franklin. For those of you who don't know, the good Dr. Franklin, this was attributed to him in 1811 by an early biographer, Jared Sparks, and we all use this quotation to remind us how infrastructure is built. So, and we, you know, you can read it, we hang together, we shall most surely hang separately. The significance of the date is that was the moment of the Declaration of Independence, which to many people not far from us would have been <coughs> considered an act of treason. But I also picked Benjamin Franklin, not just because he reminds us that we're all in this together, but because 20 years earlier, he had published letters in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society on his experiments with electricity. Indeed, when you say go fly a kite, it meant something quite different. And experiments in his observations in electricity, of course, were the grand challenge problems of his day. Nowadays, he'd be in CERN working on the Higgs boson. Well, in those days, he was flying a kite and telling us something about the nature of electricity. And he published four articles for uh, letters from Dr. Franklin from America in between, I think, 1751 and 1755. So he was a physicist, he was <clears throat> and a scientist, natural philosopher. He also, of course, was a diplomat and a politician. He was a printer and a publisher. He was an editor and a writer. He formed a book club among the, uh, the apprentices in Philadelphia. Yes, before Oprah, we had book clubs. And he, formed, he was a patron of one of the first, or perhaps the first, the librarians, correct me, public library in, the United, in what became the United States in Philadelphia. So he was all of us, to quote Pogo. And as we go forward, I would ask us to try to be him. Thank you. So I'd like to thank Dr. Friedlander for her amazing talk. Uh, Dr. Friedlander, I want to say, you know, just recently I filled out the new NIH, U.S. NIH biosketch, and for the first time ever, I got to put down a scholarly product that was not a publication, it was a data standard, and I want to thank you for giving us credit for the things that we never, ever thought that we would get credit for. That was NIH, not NSF. But you started it! <laughs> You were first, and I know you had a hand in all of that, so thank you for that. Um, I also, I'll start off with the first question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, with the data standards and the data sharing plans, 
You know, one of the things that, that we see in, in trying to help researchers with their data is that they really don't know the answer to what to put in that. And yet the review panels are getting better now at, at starting to um, be able to, to take those things into consideration. Do you have any ideas for how we could inspire some collaboration between researchers pre um, uh, submission on their data sharing plans or even post submission on their data sharing plans? So is anyone here from the California Digital Library? We had CDL has a very good, Martin, I think you have a tool, don't you? That is designed to answer that question. Anyone here from Johns Hopkins? Hopkins has a tool that helps people do that. And yes, they're very high level. It says, what's your data? And of course, at the beginning of a project, you may not know what that is. So a lot of this is, it's easier to do in say, there's a, a big piece of the biological sciences director, which is completely devoted to data. Not just informatics, but it's com so that one's easier. You know, they know what they're looking for because the point of the exercise is the creation of, of reusable data sets. Um, others are, are more are harder to anticipate, and that's fair enough. But there are tools. This question has been out there, and the three that I'm I think Indiana Martin does Indiana have one too. So the schools of library and information science have actually been quite aggressive. So my advice to you is to talk to Hopkins. Catch, Mar uh, catch Martin at the break, uh, California Digital Library in Indiana. So those are the four big ones, Martin. No, not so everyone can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is a problem. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Uh, thanks very much for that um, good description of everything. Um, so I just have one sort of um, observation connected to Melissa's question a little bit. Um, so from my personal experience, sitting a researcher down in front of, not to single anybody out here, but it was actually the, um, the DMP tool, um, which, is, which is a great effort. Sitting them down in front of it, it actually doesn't help them very much at all because it's so high level. So, you know, um, it's, it's a start, but there's still a lot more that's, that's needed to be done. And the, um, the original question that I have, which is sort of associated with that, is that you have three parties, three kind of stakeholders in these conversations. You, ha um, you have uh, publishers and funders and authors. And usually when you talk to funders about these things, they say as you have, well, you know, we're taking input from the community and the other stakeholders about how these things should look. You talk to the publishers and the publishers say, well, you know, we're listening to our researchers and, you know, to our communities and, you know, um, the other stakeholders and we're taking input on how these things should look. You talk to the researchers and say, well, we're waiting for the publishers and the funders to tell us what to do. You gave an example of how you got very good compliance with submission of data management plans, even though they may have some problems with them still. But you're putting, passing the buck off onto the study sections and these other people who um, aren't, still aren't very well educated um, about, you know, how to make a good data management plan to actually do the enforcement of that. And, and that's why, you know, you kind of have the, these mandates that have been on the on the books for say years now with so low compliance levels. So I guess the question really is, what do you think a funder's role is in breaking this kind of detente where everyone's trying to pass the buck off of, on to everyone else? Well, I, I mean, it's one person's respect for disciplinary heterogeneity if somebody else is passing the buck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the first flip in it. I mean, and, and I also acknowledge that I like silos, too. So, you know, let's be clear about what we're talking about here uh, or who we're talking to. Um, again, I, I don't, I, yesterday, um, who was here cross rep? Right, at my age, I'm, I, you know, I, after I passed my 60th birthday, I decided I didn't need to learn new, new names any longer. So I apologize, I don't remember your name, but I do remember your affiliation. You made a very important point early on, and you said that infrastructure is A, invisible when it behaves itself, and I agree, and two, that it's slow. So remember the over-engineer premature specification one? We may have to have a period of time when it feels like, yes, we're all passing the buck until this simply works itself out. So do I think that um, 
a data management plan might be a reason for a poor score on, or poor rating, as we say in NSF, um, I, I don't think that's how you want to think about it. I think you want to think about transforming the culture so that investigators think about the management of the data as they're conceptualizing the project. So, you know, my own formal background, I said my PhD was in history, it, it was amazing to me that you didn't think about your data. I mean, I thought a lot about my data and what would happen to the data. And, and so, you know, th there were several hundred years of historians worrying about that, that to which I was heir. And I, I think that we're the, at the beginning of a time when, you're, when the communities and the individuals within them are going to have to think about it. So, you know, from the management point of view, from the evaluation point of view, should there be a degree of tolerance? Of course. On the other hand, does that mean that the professional societies, for example, don't have a role here of articulating that in bi biology, wildlife ecology, pick your, pick your discipline, here's what good data management work looks like. I think that's an important role for the professional societies to undertake, and having undertaken it and achieved some reasonable consensus, well, yes, we would like at NSF at least to say, okay, as part of the resources, when you think about assembling your project, your application to us, your proposal, look at this. But it's the role of the professional societies, I would argue, to tell us what this is for that field. And it's the role of the review panel to tell us whether or not this is a sensible solution given the nature of the research that's been proposed. So, some research doesn't require elaborate data management, certain kinds of abstract mathematics. You know, and then the answer is no data management, or you're doing a workshop. It's meaningless. We're going to have a report at the end of the workshop. Does everybody really want to read the transcripts of all these things? Think of all the ones you've sat through and how many times. Okay, let, here's a time to be honest. How many of us, okay, there's going to be some overachievers. How many of us have actually read the full transcripts of the meetings that we've attended? Okay, there's always, yeah, Dan, I knew you would. Another one. I'm not seeing a sea of hands out here. Of course not. You're going to read, you're going to browse, you're going to re refresh your memory on what, what happened. Um, do you need to, to curate that to, for all of time? Probably not. Do you want to keep the conference, the report, back to us? Do you want to keep the publication that told us what we learned? Yes. So the point here is that if you're NSF and you fund a very broad range of activities, you don't want to over-specify at the foundation level what is required. That's our challenge. Your challenge your challenge as scholars and in your communities is to help us have the right set of standards to make available to the communities at the right time. So I just passed the buck. <laughs> so Martin Halbert, University of North Texas. Thank you, Amy. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, you know, to that point about the DMP tool and advice for researchers in constructing these plans, I would very much echo the point that, you know, just bringing up that DMP tool is not, you know, the end of the story. You have to have a service to, and ideally one that is, you know, collaborative between the Office of Research and the library and other vested interests in advising researchers on how to construct those things intelligently in the context of the institution and your, and your you know, intramural, in, you know, other institutional partners. Um, and, it, you know, we did this uh, study, the Data Res Project, to study the emerging landscape of research data management. And um, what we found from that, I mean, A, we found that, that the, the most successful programs at the universities were exactly those where they had a, a strong across the institution collaborative effort to, you know, tackle the, the problem of, of research data management. And, and I think, well, you know, while I gave Amy a hard time at a conversation last night, um, I do it think... It wasn't the first time, <laughs> I do think NSF very rightly, you know, while they are often pressed to take a prescriptive view on, on this issue of research data management, they appropriately take a descriptive view and say, well, really, it's the job of the field, you know, to decide what is good and appropriate research data management for the particular discipline and try to keep the policy level at an appropriately high level to cover all the different fields that you approach. So, so kudos to, to that, um, Amy, appreciation. Yeah. 
Thank you, Martin. I will say when you picked up the mar microphone, I was a little nervous. <laughs> um, Tom Gillespie, uh, UCSD. Um, so one of the concerns that has come up, not within the scientific data world, but in sort of just the big data world, like companies like Google, Microsoft, are, is this idea that we're dealing with feudalism um, in, in the way our data is being kept. And I'm wondering what you see the role of the... Um, So the, the labeling of that form as data sharing or software sharing, I think is somewhat of a misnomer and is more properly labeled preservation. The dilemma that we're facing as creators of these artifacts, objects, is that they're not static. They effectively rot because of the platform that are required to evaluate them, go away on us. When was the last time you used a fiber cord in each lobby? Um, representation's one thing, but the software itself is something that requires a very particular context. And so the, the requirements necessary for that software platform, that code to be usable over the long haul, is far more extraordinary than just managing the structure of uh, tabular data file. So I think 
take your point. And, and so the point here is a distinction between data sharing, which is roughly a contemporaneous activity, versus data preservation, which is making it available over the long term. And I've done both. And I would argue that the preservation one, although technically challenging, is in a sense easier. Because we're not challenging the individual and the individual researcher, and we're not dealing with when do I really need to make it available. So you're not getting into issues of embargo. So if we said, make your data available as a condition of publication, that is not a preservation issue, although it may become a preservation issue. It is a sharing issue, and it's breaking down a very, very high, and well, and, and, and deservedly so, uh, almost a taboo in the way research works, right? So when you're in a highly individual environment, you want to protect, in a sense, your local monopoly, your, your ability to have something unique upon which you, um, one, as the researcher, not you as an individual, you probably share at the drop of the hat. Um, uh, you want to, in a sense, share your competitive advantage, and it arises then from from this notion of science as predicated on individual achievement. So you want both sharing and preservation, and I think for that reason NSF characterizes it, characterizes it as a data management plan. And not all data, we understand, may be subject to preservation. We heard this morning, and I've heard it elsewhere, that lots and lots of data gets thrown out right away, right? That's because you can't process it. Um, or it doesn't get used. So, you know, here, I can give you a story about the Stanford Linear Accelerator. I went out there to, you know, this was going to visit physics. <clears throat> and like all non-physicists, I'm kind of nervous around physicists. They use math, and it's a big machine, and they do scary things, and, and they're really smart. So let's just stipulate that going into it. Um, so I went out to Stanford, and um, I went to, to Slack, and it's in a remote facility away from the main campus. And a very nice astrophysicist came out and explained what they do. And, and I said, well, what does it come off of? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's raw data and there's the process data. And they store it on mag tape. And they put the mag tape in absolutely perfect preservation conditions. It's in a cool, dark room. And it's stacked up. And it's appropriately labeled. It's in the canisters. It is perfect. This is Stanford. And we would expect no less. OK, I said. Who uses it? What's in it? Well, you know, is that what comes off? Well, you know, what comes off the, um, the machine? But, well, a graduate student does something and runs an algorithm, and, and this is processed. Says, well, where's the documentation for that? And so there's a silence. But boy, they have the tape. So I said, well, OK. Um, I mean, I told this in the, in the math physical sciences directorate, and I, I, you know, I slipped out with my life. So um, I said, so who uses it? And they gave me the absolutely correct response. We don't use that stuff. You want to run the experiment yourself, because there's a bigger, faster machine. But they have it. And when I say mag tape, then I have um, a, a lot of architects, uh, a, a lot of archivists who get very nervous. Because of course, to recover anything from that is major heartburn. So what's the point of storing it? Well, if the, if, if the solution to that is all of the data forever and ever have to be yes, Martin, thank you for wrinkling your nose, have to be kept up and live because maybe somebody might want to, well, you know, is that an efficient use of resources? So those are the choices that you have when you get into the management space. And I agree with you that long-term management of software is difficult. Data are dynamic. We've taken the very easy case of where we know there's a beginning and an end. My favorite example as an historian is the 1850 US federal census. It's very nice. It doesn't change. It sits there on the microfilm. If you say real number something, line number something, you can be reasonably confident that someone else can follow your footsteps. Not so with data. So I think it's time for us. <laughs> so another round of applause for Dr. Peter.